Is it hard for you to talk about your sexual wants, needs, and desires? Well, you're not alone. It's hard for everybody. And that's no pun intended. Are you hard right now and can't talk about it? Well, if so, this podcast is for you. Uh, hi, I'm Toby. I'm from the band Emory. I've also led a bunch of men's groups with the True Man Experience. And uh, I'm working on this podcast with Dr. Stormy, who is an amazing sex coach who has helped so many people. And that's what we're here to do. We were here to open up the conversation. You need to be able to talk about your sexual desires, your wants, and yes, even your needs and where you can take your sex life with your partner. So sit back, relax. We're taking listener questions. We're going to have a great episode. Join us because this is the sex education you always wish you would have gotten. All right, we're back. Sex 101 podcast. I am happy to be back. I was just talking with you, Stormy, about being on tour and I'm getting older and it's harder. <laughs> and what's crazy, too, is uh, when you're on tour, you're eating late at night and you just don't, you know, you're waking mm -hmm. up early because you have to drive to get to the next show. So you don't go to bed till 12 or 1. You're up by right. 730, you know, a.m. Yeah. You just, you know, played. we played a, one show in Columbia. It got so hot that a lady passed out in the front row we had to pause oh the show for them. yeah they did oh. in, in columbia south carolina in july they're like we don't need air condition <laughs> I, like, I think you do i actually oh think that's gosh. one you know with the you know 200 people all packed into this little tiny room you kind of need wow well this is what comes to mind for me there is i was like wow it's so fun to be doing this podcast with like a rock star. I love knowing a rock star, Toby. You're such a rock star. But I just was laughing because it was like what we think rock stars' lives are like and what they actually are like, right? Like the what we think a tour is like versus what it's actually like. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we got a great episode today. Uh, this is going to be a two-parter. This is the first part of six common bedroom blunders. And uh, I'm excited about this one because I have a feeling I have done these or possibly still do some of these. So I want to learn <laughs> what my blunders are. <laughs> this is going to be a personal episode for me, but I'm excited <laughs> about this uh, because I think a lot of times people just think you get in there and you'll figure it out. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't think people put enough time into thinking about uh, what's going on and how it can improve because I, it really is. I, I believe, especially growing up in the very uh, Christian Bible belt South, People didn't talk about sex, so you don't even know sometimes what your blunders are. You're not even thinking right. about it. You just think, try to do the best you can. And so often sex it infiltrates its way into everything else, you know? So if you have a, if you're Absolutely. making mistakes here, you're making mistakes other places, and you're not mm -hmm. realizing. So uh, this is going to be a great episode. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's also like we always say, like, everyone wants to have great sex, and most people don't want to talk about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Our listeners and viewers want to talk about it. We're talking about it. So obviously, we're not going to just give you the common blunders and like leave you feeling badly about yourself right. we're also going to get to you with some some practical solutions to these very common issues that show up in in the bedroom for couples you know and then the other thing you know so it's like let's start talking we always say on, on sex 101 podcast let's start talking about it let's start educating on it let's start asking all the good questions i just did like a three-day conscious leadership training and they were talking about you know appreciative inquiry in that world of study but it, uh, one of the things i love about it is like our life is determined our growth is determined by the questions we ask and just as much by the questions we don't ask, right? So in this podcast, we're asking, you right. all are asking the questions and we are giving you some answers and some education. So I just, I love it. Super excited to get into it today. Yeah, 100%. Because I've been in relationships where I was told the problems, but no solutions. <laughs> <laughs> or I've done the exact same where I was like, hey, you're doing right. this. You know, I use that. I've used, I've, one of the big things I've learned, and this is what I love about our podcast. I think a lot of people get into trouble using that you language instead of mm -hmm. I, I feel this mm -hmm. way. I'm experiencing this. I want you to know how I'm and go, no, you did this, you know? And so I think mm -hmm. we're going to uh, step into some stuff here. That's going to be very helpful to people. So let's get into it. All right. Well, so when I was thinking about six common bedroom blunders, right, um, as a sex and intimacy coach, right, I, I work with a lot of men, women, and couples, plus I've had my own sexual journey. I'm 46 years old, so I've had my own experience and just friends. And, you know, it was interesting. I even pulled a few friends. We were with a few friends, and I was like, okay, top six, you know, bedroom blunders. And so we, I got there and put on it, too. We had a hilarious conversation over a glass of wine. Um, but, you know, it's the... The, the idea is that these are very common challenges in the bedroom, okay? So this isn't to make you feel badly if you're like, oh, wow, all six of these I've done or still do. <laughs> it's, to, <laughs> it's to really educate you to be a better lover, to have. Yeah. Uh, and then you also said, Toby, like, our sex life seeps into so much, so many areas of our life, right? So I, I say, 
uh, what happens in the bedroom shows up in life and what happens in life shows up in the bedroom. So if you're struggling with some of these areas, you know, it, it likely just isn't behind closed doors in the bedroom. You might be struggling yeah. with these areas in other parts of your life as well. Yeah, totally. All right. What's uh? So, well, these aren't in order either. We're just doing no, the right. No, these like, are yeah, not yeah, in okay. order, right? right? Yeah. So these are just six common bedroom blunders. So the, the first one is mismatched drive. Okay, so putting pressure, you know, and mismatch drive leads to the following blunders, which is putting pressure on sex, expecting sex, or this sort of like, oh, I need to do it. Let's just get it over. And I'm like doing my grocery list or my taxes in my head, or right? Yeah. right? Like I'm not, it's like, we're just, let's just get it over with. So all those sort of uh, approaches to sex, which really have to do a lot of times with mismatched sex drive, with mismatched, mismatched libido. Um, so it's really common, right? I mean, think about it. Like libido is not a set point for one individual, right? So my libido waxes and wanes, your libido waxes and wanes. So now you have waxing and waning libido within each individual. And then you have two of you, if you're in a monogamous partnership and you're trying, you're, you know, we have this expectation that they're going to, that our libidos are going to match up exactly. It just really often isn't the case. So I think understanding that, that your sex drive, your libido is not a set point. It changes it changes hour by hour, actually, for each individual. It changes day by day, changes in the cycles and the transitions you're in your life. But the, you know, so you're going to hear this in all of these blunders, this thread of what do we, what are some things we can do about it is it's a very common reported problem for challenge for couples is mismatch libido. I want sex more. They want sex more. I don't want sex. He doesn't want sex, right? The, all the different iterations yeah. of it. Um, but communication is really a key on this one. Uh, the under, that understanding that it's not a set point and then the communicating what is your sexual desire like i mean most couples haven't even haven't even shared with each other how many times a week would you want to be having sex like in this moment in your life right not like when you were 20 or whatever but in this time of your life how what what is your preference and have this conversation with your partner what's their preference also, how do they define sex? Because we've talked about in many episodes, we can be so myopic in how we define sex. Like penetration is sex. Well, it's hopefully you've learned from the Sex 101 podcast, if nothing else, that sex is much broader than that. So, you know, how many times a week do you as your partner want to have sex? How many times a week would you want to have sex? Yeah. Right? And this is not if the star is perfectly aligned and the kids aren't sick and the to-do list is done. I mean, because those things just rarely happen. In your life, as it currently is, what's your... What's your sexual preference? What's your desire for frequency? And what does that mean? Are you just talking about penetrative sex? Or are you talking about, like for me, I'm like, well, sometimes I just want to like make out and roll around and have foreplay. I don't even care about the sex part, right? So right. what is it for you? So that communication is really important. I think you're right. Like in so many other areas of like marriage or relationships, you talk about things repeatedly, like finances mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. how, where are we going to meet up with friends or family or, you know, like mm -hmm. you, there's all these other things. Whether you talk about your job daily and then oftentimes mm -hmm. we don't talk about sex. And then I think too, when you were just talking, I think sometimes we buy into the cliches or the myths. Like all a guy wants to do is stick his hard penis into in and jackhammer. Mm -hmm. And that's all, all he wants. And mm -hmm. having worked with a lot of men, men, often are thinking way more outside the box than just penetrative sex. They want to be mm -hmm. made out with and desired mm -hmm. and touched in different places and, and just experience the fullness of sex rather than you're right. That myopic view of, well, this is what it is. Let's get it done. And then, and not even ever talk Absolutely. about it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and life happens. Like I hear so often from my clients, like, well, my life is busy or I have littles in the house and, you know, it's really hard to it, like, those are not excuses. Those are logistical things in your life. So I always say like work with the logistics, right? Don't make it of like, Oh, we'll do it later. Or we'll do it when the kids are grown or whatever. It's like, no, now in the current present situation that you have in your household with your partner, how can you create that intention and attention intention and attention for your sex life right so uh you know this is one area where scheduling sex i have mixed feelings on scheduling sex but in this as a sex therapist but in this situation scheduling sex can actually if you are like really busy and you have littles going you know in the house and you know you just have a full life a lot of many of us work and have other roles at home um you know or just we manage the household and that's a more than full-time job as anyone knows who's just who has managed a home, not just who has wonderfully managed a home, but what is, so scheduling sex can actually be a really beautiful thing because it can take the pressure off. Like, when are we going to fit it in? It's like, you've literally created time in your schedule for two, for sex. Right. So it can be a really great way to help bridge mismatched drives. 
Yeah, I think and the the one of the reasons why that works is it makes you feel desired and wanted. It's like, wait, mm -hmm. our schedule's so busy, all this, but you are thinking about me. You know, you are totally. like we can uh I, with with my ex, we used to have a kind of a cool policy that worked really well. It would be uh you can we can say no two times and the third time we we're like it doesn't matter. We're going to be here for each other. You know what I mean? We're going to be here r mm. romantically, sexually with each other. So like, if you're like, Hey, I want to, ha can we have sex tonight? Uh, I just don't know if I'm in the mood. Then we would, we wouldn't do it. If, if it goes, you know, you wait and it, it could be the next day. It could be the next, you know, next week, whatever it was, we would mm. do some stuff like that. And then by the other time we're like, wait a minute, we've realized that we haven't done this twice now. And that recognition mm -hmm. of it just made us realize, Oh wait, instead of, it was more of the recognition of, Hey, are totally. we connecting this way? What what are we right. what are we doing here? And it was really helpful. It really was. Yeah, like it, it just, it just helped me realize, wait, we do want each other. Right, exactly. That desire piece is huge, right? Under knowing feeling desire for your partner and feeling their desire for you is a basic we have no greater need as humans than than the feeling of connection and belonging. Part of that yeah. in a in a romantic partnership is feeling desired, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you made me you made me think of when you were saying that what you and your one of the strategies you and your ex wife had is that, you know, understanding how your desire works is is a thing that I love to help my clients on, you know. We, we think everyone's sexual desire works in the same way, but that is not the like, yeah. case. But I highly recommend Emily Nagoski's book, Come As You Are. Amazing. She's brilliant. Um, but it helps really understanding the desire system. So, you know, for, for statistically in the U.S., most men have what we call spontaneous desire, about 85% according to most studies. So being exactly what it sounds like, spontaneous desire, like lightning bolt desire, like come out of nowhere and you're like, whoa, I'm feeling turned on, right? <laughs> That's spontaneous desire. But about only 25% of women in the U.S. have spontaneous desire. And the responsive desire or contextual desire is there's like a slow burn, right? I have to be turned on. I have to be aroused to feel desire if I have a responsive desire pattern. And that's about 15% of men and about 75% of women. So you can see some of the like, you know, it's, yeah. it's just a great thing to like start to get curious. There's different desire quizzes. You can read Emily Nagoski's book. There's different ways to understand how does your... Uh, Esther Perel calls it, how do you get, how does your erotic energy start to be turned on, right? So understanding that is a huge other tool to help couples have better sex, right? To have better connection and better sex. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. The mismatched is real. I'm, I'm wondering when my sex drive is going to slow down. I feel like since about 16, <laughs> it's always just been, I'm like, well, maybe one day. <laughs> that's the, that's a great thing about you but that's beautiful you just get to own that you know it's really and you know i i'm the same way i typically the one with the higher desire in my partnership and in my marriage and i know i know i've shared really openly like that was a huge struggle for me we were in in what, what would be defined as a low sex marriage felt like a no sex marriage so, but you know i i'm i'm grateful for that part of my journey it led me to become a sex and intimacy coach and learn everything i could and study everything i could so that that would never be the pattern in in a relationship for me right yeah. so we you know we learn about our own drive and, and you know i had menopause like overnight because i had an emergency hysterectomy and that was yeah. a bitch you know but i was like okay this is not going to run my sex drive i'm going to be in sovereignty here and i'm going to do practices and i have been able to do that so i think we can also really take some reclamation of our own drive and how we feel arousal and that's a really that's a really amazing thing when we start to reclaim that for ourselves and, and then that benefits our partnership. Yep. You're exactly right. And learning about yourself is always helpful. Like figuring out who mm -hmm. you are in the bedroom, outside of the bedroom. I mean, I definitely learned probably, you know, late in my marriage that touch is so important to me and, mm. and that I was like, that was one of the main ways that we touched. And so that's where I was like, Oh, I, I longed for it. Cause I was even wanting right. that touch. You know what I mean? I was right. wanting the, the before and after just as much right. as the sex. And so I've mm -hmm. learned that about myself so that I'm, I'm realizing too, it's not just being horny. It's that, that desire to be touched, mm -hmm. to touch yeah. and to, and to do those things, you know, and, and that is really yeah. helpful for me to know about myself. Totally. Absolutely. Right. This is why, you know, that growth mindset, personal development is so huge. And one of the things that we get really passionate about is often, even in growth mindset, growth oriented people, 
it, it's sort of like, well, okay, I'm willing to grow and look at myself anywhere except for in the bedroom. <laughs> right? right. So we're really saying no growth mindset goes into the bedroom. How do we all become better lovers? How do we all receive more pleasure? How do we have more passion, better orgasms in our life? Like these are the things that are, you know, I, I've said before, like, I hope I want to be like a pleasure pusher. I want to help people, our listeners their watchers learn how to have more pleasure in all parts of their life, including in the bedroom. Yeah. Perfect. All right. What's number two. So number two is assuming that you know what your partner wants in bed and that you're meeting those needs. Okay. So <laughs> assume, assuming, assuming, assuming is little, isn't it like assume means ass out of you and me, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's just, I can, I can almost promise you assuming in the bedroom is not going to be accurate. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have a high enough calling to even know and understand our own needs, wants, and desires in the bedroom, let alone assume we can intuit our partner's needs, wants, and desires. So, you know, this really comes down to that assuming piece, which is not an effective communication strategy. Um, but where some of the, so some of the, the things you can do in your partnership to help this blunder to help remediate this blunder is to communicate right to to ask to figure out what you want need and desire in the bedroom so ask yourself first and then to ask your partner and these are not easy conversations to have especially if you have a pattern of not communicating a, about sex right in yeah. your partnership but there you gotta just start somewhere so start today start having these conversations, you will have a better intimacy, a deeper connection, and better sex if you're communicating about your sex life. Yeah, 100%. And I think, too, uh, that can even, uh, that doesn't mean don't try things or don't, you know, no. I mean, obviously always with consent, but I mean, you can try things and do things, but like, uh, you you know, there's still, there's conversation before, there's conversation during, there's conversation after, mm -hmm. all of these things you go, oh, do you really, did you like that or didn't you? Totally. you know, there, you know, yeah. there was there was a time where I had a girlfriend where I thought she loved her ears being nibbled because she would kind of do like that, but she just she mm -hmm. thought it was just ticklish and what it was not a turn on. And I was like, oh, when I get to her earlobes, boy, she's she, you know, <laughs> a little shaky already. And I was like, oh, and later she was like, yes. I, just don't, I don't love that. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> you know what I mean? Just something so simple like that that I yes. that, that I wouldn't have done. You know, I just thought right. I was doing something to turn her right. on. I was just, I was just totally. totally wrong because I just I didn't read the body language or anything. And if all I had to say is, "Do you like this?" You know, and it, it right. could have That's amazing. added so much. That's, right. That's a great thing you said. So don't be afraid to try things. But then the feedback is key, right? Like you were you said there that really great example, like. You, you thought her little pulling away was like, oh, I'm super doing it more. And her pulling away was like, oh my gosh, I don't love that, right? Like, which is, so it, there's, no, there's nothing wrong at all. That's what a beautiful interaction. That's a great example because it's like, yeah, absolutely try things. But then that feedback, I love what you just said, like the before, during, you know, during and after feedback, feedback, feedback. Like, so it could be something like, you know, what did you love about our lovemaking session? What felt really good to you today? Because maybe- yeah. It was something new, right? So those are really great questions. And and they just, you know, they're not easy. Um, these are tender subjects. Like I, my TikTok's called touchy subjects for a reason, right? These are touchy right. subjects. Um, but it's really a beautiful, it really helps with intimacy and connection to have these conversations. And um it popped in my mind as I was preparing for this, like one of the, um, so I love different tools because I love tools, right? Because if we bring a tool into something it gives us something tangible to work with into a hard right. situation so there's different tools out there to understanding your own needs wants and desires right and then understand asking questions and learning about your partner's needs wants and desires so one of the tools i like is called a wants wills wants list i've mentioned it in different episodes before but what it is is a very long robust list um, of all the different things in the bedroom sexual acts physical acts um, and then it's yes i want to yeah yes, I will, or no, I won't, right? And you do it and your partner does it. And then you have a great conversation tool. So you can email me for that stormy at lovedeeplab.com. Just put wants, wills, wants in the subject and I will send that over to you. But it is that will let you know it's very detailed. So you can also like do parts of it if you, that's a good entry point. Uh, it gets more and more uh, detailed, more and more racy, but it's a great tool. So find a tool. If it's not that tool, there's other tools out there because it can give you something even outside the bedroom to say, hey, you know, on a date night, like, hey, babe, like, let's do this together. This would be super sexy and fun. And I really want to know what turns you on in the bedroom, you know, I and your partner that. might be like, well, we've been sleeping together for 15 years. And you're like, I know, look at them, look at me go. <laughs> right. 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 Mm -hmm. And, 
you aren't the same person you were 15 years ago. No. You know what I mean? You might, some right. things you might be want now and some things you might actually want to try now, you know, so it's, it's good to do that. I want, I'm going to email you and get that list too. I'd like, to, <laughs> like to fill that out. I think that's, that's a, great. A funny little story about the first time I did it. Uh, there's different like variations. I have my like own iteration on it now, but when I did it for uh, someone else's, I was on with my current boyfriend. I was on a plane. <laughs> I don't recommend doing it on a plane <laughs> because the person next to me, like, I, like just kept like looking over and I was like getting so red and embarrassed because it gets pretty like detailed. Yeah. And I was, and then I couldn't stop laughing because I'm like, well, you're welcome. I wanted to like, give it to her, you know, be All like, right. here you go. Here's a tool. But it was, so I don't recommend doing it on an airplane, but that was my situation with it. <laughs> oh boy. She said, I'll have what she's drinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, number three. So this one is a big one with couples. It's I'm too tired for sex or I'm too stressed for mm, sex, right? Yeah, not tonight, one. not feeling it, got a headache, right? Yeah. All the things, right? And again, these are not excuses. We are not saying to override. We're saying the opposite of overriding your needs, wants, and desires, but we're saying about communicating them, right? So I'm too tired for sex. I'm too stressed for sex. Super, super common report in monogamous couples. Hey, exhaustion and stress is the, is a real deal. We live in a world that is high stress, right? They call it, we call it you stress, like the collective stress and also distress, right? Yeah. So it's a real thing. This is not to invalidate your stress in any way, shape or form. So, and stress is a pleasure buster, like hormonally, neurochemically, stress and pleasure don't, are not, they, they, they're, they are not friendly together, right? They are yeah. in contrast to each other. So, so one of the things I recommend because stress is a real deal and exhaustion is the real thing is first a great question is, Hey, like, Hey babe, like I'm curious about like how you're feeling about stress in your life right now. Like where, where is your stress on a scale of one to 10? Where would you put it right now? Maybe you break it down relationally, work, family, kids, whatever, financially, right? Different areas and get curious about your, your stress and your partner's stress. And then also a great, thing to learn even in couples that have been together for a long time is how does your partner respond to stress from a sexual perspective so some people think oh my god sex is the best like stress reliever and some people are like oh hell no when i'm stressed out sex is the last thing on my mind okay so and there's no wrong or right there's no good or bad but how does your partner how do you respond to stress as far as in terms of sex and how does your partner respond it is a great conversation point. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a great thing. Helps you understand of like, wow. Okay. So let's say my partner is like, no, when I'm stressed, I have no desire for sex. And I'm like, oh my God, when I'm stressed, it's like my favorite stress reliever. Right. Well, we have a mismatch there. So understanding that and knowing where we are, how we respond to stress and where we are on our stress level helps to really understand your partner and not to personalize it. If there's, if one person is in the mood, one person's not different things like that. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I think too. I think sometimes when we when we are stressed, we get so in our head that it pulls us away from our family, our lovers, mm -hmm. our relationships. You know what I mean? Because we can get in our head and just be thinking about that only, which is just a it, that just uh, snowballs and gets worse and worse. That's the way. I, oftentimes, I've handled stress where I just kind of pull away and something's so mm -hmm. heavily on my mind that it, you know, it's a. I, I could be affected physically, you know, I just, I don't totally. feel good. I have headaches, Absolutely. I'm exhausted, don't want any of any of that stuff. And so it's, we, we partner up in life to help carry the load. So don't forget that. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, the, like, yeah, the, like well your partner said. is your mm -hmm. partner and mm -hmm. allow them to, you know, love you how you want to be loved. And, and I, even though that is hard, but you're right. Like this, the, just saying no, sometimes no is such a strong word. I mean, I've really mm -hmm. thought about that word, how powerful it is to be such a small word, mm -hmm. how much, you know, hurt and damage it can do and how much good it can do. It's such a powerful totally. word. And so uh, I, I think a lot of times we, we use no too quickly when we're, th when we're actually saying, I'm just, I, I wish I had uh, better health mm -hmm. or I wish I was in a better mental state mm -hmm. or, or I'm yeah. exhausted or I feel anxious right? or whatever these are. Yeah. And I'm saying no to a lot of things. Uh, just because mm -hmm. I'm so concerned with my life right now. Right. Right. And my bandwidth is low, right? Like yeah. when I'm stressed out, my bandwidth, like I don't have bandwidth for things I typically have bandwidth for. Right. So um, Brene Brown, I just saw a great clip. I love her. Uh, everything that comes out of that woman's mouth is brilliant yeah. uh, in my opinion, but I just saw a clip. Um, her, her husband's name is Steve. And she was talking about 
um, that like the whole 50, 50 bullshit, right? Like relationships are, it's beautiful when they are 50, 50, but let's be honest, they're just rarely 50, 50, yeah. you know, marriages and relationships. So, but that like understanding each other, where, where you are on your bandwidth, like maybe she said her and her husband will be like, I got 20%, right? Like I'm 80% maxed out. I got 20% bandwidth. It's like, well, then someone else, then your partner needs to make up the other 30% for you guys to be at a 50, 50, right? right? Right. So that it's right. Or maybe your partner's like, you know, I got 90% today. I'm feeling really in like, and then, and then it's beautiful when it is more aligned, but then when it's not, you have some understanding of where your partner is, what's their bandwidth, what's their reservoir. And then also you mentioned to me, like, so it might just be as simple as like helping share the chore load a little differently when your partner's really stressed out. It really might be that simple that your partner now has more space and openness to physical connection because they're not they're not like climbing to bed so tired they can't even see straight so there's just a lot there that understanding about about you know and one of the other strategies for this if i'm too tired or i'm too stressed for sex is i'm trying to match up your schedules a little better trying as much as you can with with all the logistics of your life and even again back to scheduling time for sex right like to change up the time of day maybe if you're like climbing to bed and trying to make love with your partner and you're like i can't even like see straight i'm so tired right yeah. maybe try in the morning or maybe there's a way to like, you know, get home 20 minutes early before the kids get home or whatever it is, like get creative, changing up the time of day and trying to match up your schedules can really help with some of the, with the long to-do list that so many of us carry, right? Our right. culture is not rest positive. We have this whole like, Oh, I've got, I've done all of this. Have I done enough so I can rest? Right. I love this, the idea of like, actually, am I rested enough so I can do what I need to do? Like really yeah. sh shifting that because you know, that's a rhetoric thing. Like our yeah. culture promotes productivity, promotes over busyness, yeah. promotes like, right. We, we, we glorify that like, oh my gosh, I've got 55 things on my to-do list. And I'm totally a victim of that. I'll be like, I have 50 things on my to-do list and I got them all done. Look at me go. And it's like, what? No, that's horrible. Right. 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 So, productivity, yeah. productivity, productivity. Mm -hmm. It never ends. I, right. I think we're learning that more and more. We're so busy these days that we don't even, you know, take time to yeah. really enjoy the things that that got us here. So, sure. well, these are great. And we were going to have three more uh, yes, on sir. our next episode. So yeah. there's more blunders to come. So <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, I got a good stump stormy this week. All right. <laughs> going, going a little off topic, but I thought this is kind of, kind of interesting. It's time to... Stop so in a tongue in cheek study, researchers once tried to find correlations between premature ejaculation and certain personality tra traits. Surprisingly, they discovered that fans of what cartoon character were more likely to experience premature ejaculation. Where do you find these I things? Know. I'm stumping Wait, you. Are you I'm you're gonna... definitely, by the way, if I, I don't know, I, like, you might get this. answered this, if I answered the spot on i would be like a ninja warrior s <laughs> because like come on this is so random okay so um i'm gonna say roadrunner oh that's a really good guess you are so <laughs> close you're really in the ballpark there i don't know speedy gonzalez <laughs> oh my <laughs> I was along the same genre. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, that's same hilarious. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Lo actually tunes. scientifically proven. Well, it, it says a tongue-in-cheek study, but it did. It said. Oh my god. It said they did. Surprisingly, they discovered that those who were avid fans of the Speedy Gonzalez cartoon character were more likely to experience that premature ejaculation. Is funny. That is that is that is great. I do not know how you find your research studies, but I, I love that. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good. All right, let's get to the listener questions. Have a question? We've got answers. Here's this week's listener question. All right, here comes our uh, first listener question. Uh, I'm not sure if there is another word for it, but my girlfriend queefs a lot during sex. I don't mind it, but she's mentioned being self-conscious about it. Is there anything we can do to minimize this? Love the show. This comes from Houston. Queef have a problem. <laughs> I love your title. So good. <laughs> 
so good. Okay, so first of all, uh, the technical term because you asked is vaginal flatulence. Okay. Okay. It's just it's simply also known as queefing. It is simply air moving out of the vagina, trapped air moving out of the vagina. Um, you know, just to it's totally normal. It is you know it is totally normal. Uh, the other uh, interesting thing is because I don't. The reason I actually prefer the term queefing to vaginal flatulence is right, if we think of flatulence, we think of like smelly farts, right? But this is this has no odor, but it may, because it's just an expulsion of air. So there, mm-hmm. there's no odor to queefing. That's one of the like wives' tales. Um, you know, but as far as your question of what you can do to minimize it, if it's something she doesn't like, right? And by the way, this doesn't just happen for female in during sex. It can also happen like in yoga or a different stretching right because there's an expulsion when it's when air enters it gets trapped there's an air bubble it, it it's expelled out so with sex though one way you can minimize it is less in and out right so the penis going in and out less the toy going in and out less it's the in and out that creates that allows the air to enter so less in and out you can even change positions while staying inside this is like what different things that you can do so less in and out um the other thing is that usually more lube will be less there'll be less vaginal flatulence that way, less, more lube. And, you know, if we've had episodes, I'm all about lube, 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 and more lube. Yep. Um, and then the last thing is pelvic floor exercises. So like proper Kegels, right, to strengthen that pelvic floor can help with the minimizing of vaginal flatulence. Hmm. Very helpful. All right, next question. I was wondering if using bigger toys with my wife would make my penis feel less pleasurable for her. I love using toys with her, but still want her to enjoy me and this comes from biggie smalls yeah well so it's a great question and i just you know again i just i love our listeners they have the most amazing vulnerable powerful courageous questions so but toys are not a replacement for you when we've done episodes on sex toys you can definitely check those out but toys are not a replacement for your partner it's just not what happens, right? It's not statistically research oriented what happens. It's not my experience. It's not anecdotally what happens. It's a, the whole idea of using a toy as a team player. Okay. So just kind of relax yourself that you're, you're, if you're going to try a toy, it is not going to replace you. The toy, the vibrator, the dildo, whatever it is, is not attached to the person that you love and are choosing to have sex with, right? So they are very different. Okay. Um, you know, and that one of the things I would ask is ask her like does she are you assuming she wants to try something bigger or has she shared that with you right so you maybe maybe check in there like you know maybe it's just something novelty she's like you know i want to feel what that would feel like but it's just like one time right or or, you know whatever get curious about what is that for her right so that for for women there's often this desire to feel a sense of fullness right um, and that doesn't have to necessarily do with size or girth or anything. It's just feeling the wholeness, right? It's just similar for men. There's a lot of a, a men often will enjoy a, a feeling of tightness, snugness, right? So, um, and I always say it's not the size of the boat. It's the motion of the ocean, right? So your penis is perfect. Okay. Your penis is perfect. And it really is the motion of the ocean. Um, so you can know that and take that in. Uh, but also, you know, Maybe it's the size she's wanting. Maybe it's more clitoral stimulation she's wanting. Maybe she's wanting a little bit more direct stimulation to her G spot. So again, back to the communication piece. What is it she's desiring or you think she's desiring and have that conversation? And then maybe you pick a toy together. That also makes it like collaborative, right? It's not like mm-hmm. her off, like sneaking, you know, off to get a toy. It's you guys doing it together. And that could be a really sexy thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, when I say that you're, a toy will never replace your partner, it's like it's this really invitation. And I know that our listeners are not this, but like I always say to when I'm working with my clients, like, don't be a lazy lover, be a proactive, be an engaged lover. And it sounds like this man is right. He's saying, I want to try this. I want to you know, pleasure her. Right. Um, but do it together. Be team player. Let, let the sex toy, if you're going to explore that bigger, smaller, vibrating, non-vibrating, you know. And then often, like I said, and often maybe she wants the vibration more than the size, right? So getting curious about that and looking through marriage supply is a great place to go. Um, You know, and Toby, I know you offer our listeners a discount for that. So you can share that, but like do it together. It can be a super fun, sexy thing to to pick a toy together. Yeah, 100%. Toys aren't uh, the end all be all. You know, we sell toys at marriage supply just to add some fun, a little risque, you know, try something new, but they never will replace you. They just won't. I mean, the person, the two people using the toys are the reason why the toy is being used, not the toy. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's not just for that. So don't, don't get in mm-hmm. your head about that for sure. 
All right. Those are great listener questions. What another good episode. And the next episode will be three more bedroom blunders. I'm excited about that. Make sure you uh, send in your your questions. You can email us. You can email Stormy at lovedeeplab.com or Toby at marriagesupply.com. And uh, email Stormy, too, with the uh, yeah. wants, wills, wants. and wants. Does, does that say it right? Wants, wills, wants. <laughs> Want, wants, wills, wants. Yeah. You can get that at stormy at lovedeeplab.com. Follow her as well on Instagram at docstormy1, the number one, or her TikTok, touchy subjects with three S's at the end. And marriage supply, you can follow us at the.marriage.supply on Instagram as well. And as always, remember knowledge is power, sex is power, and the world needs more of both.